the damsel in distress, found in a strange location, the elder priest who offers the party aid, a friendly stranger who issues a cryptic warning, the noble knight seeking glory and justice. All characters you might cross paths with and think not too much of it. However, there are schemes far greater than a mere mortal's imagination at work here. Hello, once again it is time for Monster of the Week, the show where I scour ancient texts and bring to you the monsters hidden within. Today we are talking about the notorious schemers from below, the Ravasta. These fox-like demons are creatures of extreme guile and cunning. They make excellent NPCs, whether ally, villain, or something in between. As one of the many demons capable of shifting faces, it is very rare to see the fox demon in its true form. However, if you do want to find it, look no further than the Manual of the Plains from 4th edition. So to get things started off here, we're going to talk about what it can do in battle, some of its abilities, and then of course some plot hooks. First and foremost among these abilities, as I briefly just mentioned, this creature can change form flawlessly into any other humanoid creature as long as it's of medium size. It is incredibly tough for anyone else to tell that the Ravasta actually isn't who or what it's pretending to be. This is due to a couple things. Not only is it an immaculate shapeshifter, but it is also a master of languages. The Ravasta can observe two creatures speaking in a different language for just a few moments. Its extremely cunning mind, psionic abilities, and innate demonic magic allow it to then speak that language flawlessly. In fact, the book goes as far as to say it can speak the language just as well as a native speaker of that language, meaning no accent, unless it wants to have one of course, and no one's going to be able to tell that it doesn't just know how to speak that language. This is an incredibly useful ability for shapeshifters because one of the dead giveaways of a creature impersonating another is vocal tics or accents, something like that if it doesn't speak the language the same way that creature would. However, with this vocal mimicking ability, the Ravasta's illusion is complete. As one would expect from a creature like this, it relies pretty heavily on those abilities to accomplish most of its goals. However, if it does come down to battle, this creature is no pushover. First and foremost, it has two powerful claw attacks, but these claw attacks don't inflict just physical damage, but also psychic damage and can actually cause the target to be blinded. As we get more into what it can do in battle, you'll kind of notice a theme here, but the Ravasta doesn't actively seek to totally destroy its opponent. It seeks to control what they can and can't do and hopefully escape or finish them off quickly whatever it decides is most beneficial. It also has an ability called Mind Stab that causes a psychic blast in a 25 foot radius. Very helpful if the creature gets cornered. By doing this though, it not only causes a lot of psychic damage, but also causes any of the creatures to be frightened of the Ravasta if they fail their will save of course. Its next ability however, is what really makes the Ravasta the Ravasta. This creature possesses a psychic and somewhat demonic ability called Bind. And this ability functions in a very unique way. In order to do this, only one condition has to be met. It has to be able to see the creature it's targeting. There's no attack roll, there's no save, it just has to see you. If it uses bind on a creature, that creature can then feel the Ravasta starting to take control of it. The targeted creature has a choice here. They can choose to take 4d10 psychic damage every round, or they can choose to be dominated by the Ravasta. This is not necessarily an easy choice because 4d10 psychic damage every round can really add up quite quickly. However, being dominated is probably even worse, but it won't outright kill you if you're low on hit points. The whole idea of this ability is it's just trying to break down its target until they finally give in and allow the Ravasa to take control of them. Now, while there's no save or any required attack rolls or anything for this to function, the targeted creature does get a save at the beginning of its turn. So whether it decided to go with the domination or the psychic damage, it has a chance to break free of that eventually. I just find it so interesting though that the initial effect always works and it's a choice that the player has to make. And what's cool about that is that choice is almost always going to be different depending on specific set of circumstances, what the party composition is, what their goal is, and just tons of other factors that all play into this one choice. And a lot of the time, there's not going to be one that is obviously better than the others, so it puts your players in kind of a tough position here. However, the bind ability is not where this creature's game ends, so to speak. The second part of this is an ability called Enforce Contract. Now basically what this means, if the Ravasta has someone under the bind ability, whether they're taking the psychic damage or dominated, it doesn't matter, as long as they are targeted by bind, when the Ravasta is attacked, either by melee or 
arranged as a reaction the Ravasa can force that attack to then target the creature that is under the effect of their bind ability. So meaning, they target someone with bind, they get shot with an arrow, they force that arrow instead to hit the target who is bound by them. This ability I find cool because there's no range limit or anything like that on it, so narratively, you can explain it in a way that makes sense if one is there such as the paladin goes to stab the Ravasta, and it instead commands its dominated target to step in the way and take the blow. Or if the bound target is maybe 30 feet away and it's being shot with an arrow, you can deflect that arrow to hit that target instead. Although sometimes there will be situations where there's no real logical way to kind of maneuver this. Say if the Ravasta is being stabbed by a scimitar and its bound creature is 30 feet away. Literally, I would just explain that that creature feels the effects of the blow and the Ravasta seems to be completely unharmed. If there's a logical way to spin it, go for it, but you don't have to, it's demonic magic. Now the Ravasta's last ability here is purely defensive and it makes perfect sense for this creature. It can choose to teleport 15 feet in any direction, basically to get out of the fray if it's surrounded, and then it turns invisible. Again, these creatures are very intelligent, so if it's in a fight and it thinks there's even a chance it might be destroyed, it's gonna get out of there. Ravasta is not gonna stick around and fight to the death. And if it does survive, you better believe that it's gonna come back for vengeance on those players, one way or another. That's the tricky thing about immortal beings, is that their vengeance might take 50 years, but rest assured, it is coming. Now overall, the Ravasta does have some pretty nasty abilities, but as you can see, it's primarily focused around controlling and kind of debilitating the party rather than just outright causing massive damage. The Ravasta is gonna be most effective in a situation where it has several minions to help it out. Not just because numbers are better, which is always intrinsically true in the D&D system, but because it can blend in and appear as one of its minions. So say this Ravasta is commanding, say, 10 hobgoblins. The Ravasta can easily shift itself to just look like another hobgoblin. So there might be some kind of crazy mental stuff happening, and as long as the Ravasta is able to sleight of hand it and not really get noticed, it's going to be tough for the party to pick out which one of these low-level monsters is actually the one crippling the party. One extra ability you could consider adding into this situation, which you don't necessarily have to, but it could be kind of neat to do as maybe a reactionary power, is to give the Ravasta an ability that allows it to trade places with one of its allies. Kind of like a transposition spell. Because if it can adopt the guise of anything flawlessly, it can jump around the battlefield between the other hobgoblins or whatever minions you've given to it, and the party's not necessarily going to know where it is. Just because they figured out, oh, it's this guy, it's Hobgoblin 4, that doesn't mean he's going to always be Hobgoblin 4. Maybe they strike him down, and when that guy doesn't turn into a Ravasta, they're like, wait, what, what happened? Plus, this kind of makes the encounter a puzzle for the party, which can easily be solved if they have a way of marking that creature. So maybe the hunter places his hunter's mark on the Ravasta after they figured out who it is, and then they always know where he is, even if he's jumping around. Or if there's no such ability within the party, maybe they physically mark him with some kind of paint or something. This is not an ability you necessarily have to use, but I think that could be a lot of fun and makes a great encounter just that much more memorable. Now, when it comes to lore, the books aren't exactly specific on where the Ravasta comes from, but they give us some nice clues that we can kind of draw our own conclusions from. I like it when books do that, because then when your players actually know the books, which is pretty unlikely in this situation, but let's just say they do, it means they're kind of expecting you to have your own lore built up about where these guys come from. That said though, all the books are totally subject to change in your world. You are the dungeon master. Anyways, as for the lore the books do give us, apparently the popular theory among scholars is the Ravasta comes from the Arcanaloth. Apparently the idea here is Arcanaloths were so shady and so sucky and the demons who ruled over the area where they were just were tired of their schemes and having them around, so they kicked them out. And apparently, that is where not only the Ravasta, but also the Rakshasa come from. If you're not familiar with the two monsters I'm talking about, the Arcanaloth and the Rakshasa both are in the 5th edition monster manual. Rakshasas are kind of like Ravastas in the sense where they're smart, intelligent, animalistic demons, but they're a lot more honorable and kind of have their own thing going on but I'll leave that to you to do some research into. The book does say, however, that Rakshasas kind of resent this notion that they would even be related to the Ravastas because they consider themselves so honorable. Just an interesting tidbit, and if you do have a Rakshasa in your campaign, adding in a Ravasta could add for some interesting interactions. And as far as using them in your game goes, the Ravasta can make an excellent mastermind type villain. They're the type of villain who's not gonna barge in through the front gates and be smashing cities. They're gonna have masterfully put together plans that might even take years to come to fruition, but when they do, 
do, if you're a target of the Ravasta, watch out. Essentially, the motivations for this creature is they're just extremely greedy and think very highly of themselves. So any opportunity they see to raise their station or acquire a lot of treasure and gold is going to 100% be taken with minimal risk to the actual creature itself. This actually gives us another opportunity to use them in a role that's not necessarily antagonistic. The Ravasta could make a very good ally to the party, albeit a shady one, if the party is seeking to take down some greater evil. Maybe the Ravasta wants to assist the party in their quest to take down a demon king, only because the Ravasta knows, of course, that when that king falls, there will be a power vacuum and he'll have a chance to kind of climb the ranks of the demonic hierarchy. To him, the party is simply just a tool. He's going to give them as much advantage and information as they can because he wants them to kill the king so he doesn't have to. And even if the party knows they're being used, they might be okay with it because ultimately a Ravasta is probably going to be better than whatever tyrant is up there right now. Also, this doesn't necessarily have to be limited to the lower planes or extra planar adventures. A Ravasta in the mortal world could have just as much reason to depose a king or a duke or someone of power so that they, in human form, can ascend the ranks of humanity. The key here is they're super greedy, so nothing is ever going to be enough for them. They're always hatching new plans and schemes and always looking for ways to elevate themselves. Another role the Ravasta could fill as well is as kind of an emissary for a patron. So if you have a warlock in your game whose patron is some kind of devil or demon, Ravastas could be very good kind of in-between creatures. Maybe the patron has sent the Ravasta to kind of keep an eye on your warlock and see what they're doing, make sure they're following their contract. If it's a particularly conniving or powerful demon, the Ravasta is most likely going to oblige, and hopefully gain some treasure on the way, of course. However, if the patron is exceptionally cruel, or doesn't really value the Ravasta, or just isn't as powerful as the players may think, it's possible the Ravasta may actually turn on the patron and try to get the Warlock and their party to take him down. This could make for kind of an interesting quest. What will the Warlock decide to do? If the Warlock does go for this, that could be a whole campaign unto itself. Or maybe they sell out the Ravasta to their patron. Then of course the patron is going to try to kill the Ravasta if he doesn't manage to get him and the Ravasta gets away, as is most often the case. Now the Ravasta has this enmity towards the party and wants them dead. How dare they ruin his plans that he's maybe been thinking of for years. When a Ravasta isn't actively working on one of its many schemes, however, you can often find them as merchants. They sell exceptional and exotic items for high price to anyone who's willing to pay. However, that said, most of the items they sell are going to be cursed. Whether it's something that as soon as you attune to it, you're just cursed, or something that slowly builds and eventually brings ruin to that person. Ravasta is never going to part with something that it finds truly powerful and useful. Unless an offer is made at the right price, of course. This ruinous item, though, might not even necessarily be magically cursed, but could just be a powerful item that they're looking to offload that belongs to an even more powerful demon or some kind of outer denizen. So sure, you got that awesome magic sword, that's great, Great, but now Gorthanax, the destroyer of worlds, is after you. Someone stole that sword from him months ago, and it's in your hands, so... If you're running a high fantasy setting, or you simply just like the idea of using a Ravasta, having them show up as a merchant either in a town, on the side of the road, traveling down the path, or just operating some kind of stall in a market can be a great way to introduce some interesting items into your campaign, as well as give the players a hopefully memorable RP encounter. I actually have used this creature in the past, and one of my favorite items that I ever sold to a party was a bag of holding, but he sold it for like 20 gold, which was outrageous, and of course the party jumped on that. But what they didn't know was the bag of holding was actually magically linked to another bag of holding, controlled by the Ravasta, and once there was a great amount of gold and treasure built up inside the bag of holding, it was magically snatched away. The party immediately realized what happened and made it their mission to hunt down the guy who did this to them. It was not easy to track him down, but eventually they did. They didn't actually manage to kill the Ravasta, but they ended up getting most of their stuff back, although, who knows how that Ravasta will strike at them in the future. Anyways, that's all I've got on this creature today, so hopefully you found the Ravasta interesting, and hopefully it gave you some ideas for some monsters you can use in your campaign. If you enjoyed listening to me talk about this fox demon for a while, and you want to support the channel, and you like what I do here, please subscribe, I have at least one new video every single week. And we do have a Patreon set up as well, so if you'd like to support the channel in that way, uh, you can find a link to that in the description below. And we do have a Discord now, so if you want to chat with myself and the other members of the community, please hop over there and let's talk some D&D. As always, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next week.